Good morning. Will you turn your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 2? The Gospel of John, chapter 2. With my birthday being last month and Mitzi's birthday being later this week, it's this time of the year we, we tend to feel a bit older than we ever had before. But one of the things that, that always makes us feel young again, in a sense, is going to weddings. And we've had several weddings recently and got a couple that are, that are coming up. Of course, we uh, went to Balvin and Jan's wedding not, not too long ago, and, and that was a lot of fun. And we're going to a wedding in Montgomery. Uh, Uh, in early December, and we learned a while back about Mitzi's sister getting married uh, in in November, which this was a while back, but it's coming up uh, in uh, just over a week or so, and and so Mitzi says, well, Megan's getting married. And I said, well, that's good. And she said, they're getting married in Alamarada. And I said, Alama who and where is that? And she said, well, that's over. I was thinking it was in West Pensacola. But no, it's over in the Florida Keys. And I said, oh, that'd be a great time to, for them to go and to enjoy. And we'll see them when we get back. And she said, no, you don't understand. We're going and you're doing the wedding. And I said, all right, well, I'm sure they're going to pay our travel expenses to get down there, which they're not going to do that. But we're still going to go, and so uh, we are looking forward to that. But in our text this morning in John chapter 2, Jesus is attending a wedding. And this, I'm sure, is a familiar account to many of you, but let's consider it this morning and and try to understand some of the things that are happening. I'm in John chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. The town of Cana was about nine miles away from Jerusalem, and so they're a little bit away, so they're out here in the area of Galilee. And, and back then, just similar to how things are today, weddings, particularly Jewish weddings, were a very big deal. The wedding ceremony would take place late in the evening after an extended time of feasting, and the father of the bride would take his daughter on the arm and the, the wedding party right behind, and they would go through the streets of the village uh, so that everyone could come out and congratulate the soon-to-be groom and bride. And the wedding party would eventually arrive back home at the home of the groom, and, and the wedding ceremony itself actually took place right there in the front door of the groom's house. And this was something that would go on for days and days at a time. And this wedding ceremony, the after, of course, a lot of celebrating and, and excitement. And, and one of the interesting things back in the first century, the, the couple, once they got married, they, there was no honeymoon. Rather, they continued to entertain guests you know, right after the ceremony for several days. They dressed in fancy clothes and many times actually wore crowns on their heads. And whatever the bride and groom wanted, they pretty much got during that time. But we notice a problem arising in verse number three of our text. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. We learn here that there was a problem, and yes, there was wine. There, there was no wine there at the ceremony. And so in those days, of course, as we mentioned before, this marriage feast lasted for several days, and, and guests were arriving on various days. It seems that Jesus and Mary arrived on the third day. And so, of course, as these family and friends were coming to the wedding, they were expecting refreshments and, and all of these kinds of things. And if there were to have wine to run out, it would be a social disgrace. It would be something that others would not ever let that family down about. And even in some cases, there could be legal repercussions for this type of problem happening. 
Of course, we're going to look at this solution in just a moment, but a, but a minor side note here. I do find it very interesting that Mary, the mother of Jesus, of course, turned to Jesus to solve this problem. Many of our friends, especially in the New Orleans area, believe that, that Mary has basically been elevated to the status of God, if not even uh, above uh, certain aspects of the Trinity. But we do see that Mary... She needed to turn to Jesus in order for him to solve this problem. And another side note here, looking at verse number 4, Jesus was not speaking disrespectfully to his mother. Now, we certainly don't encourage anyone to go home and address their mom as woman, but uh, it was something that was a part of that uh, day and time, and and of course Jesus intended no disrespect uh, towards Mary. But as we look at the solution to this problem and try to understand it, notice with me in verse number 6 of John chapter 2, reading through verse number 10. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus said to them, draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk that which is inferior, but you have kept the good wine until now. As the text describes, there were six uh, stone water jars that had the purpose of of purification. These waters were not used for drinking in this instance, but they were used to to help people remain sanitized. And uh, according to various ceremonial laws under the Old Testament, people became ritually unclean by touching objects of everyday life. And so before they ate, according to traditions, they would pour the water over their hands to cleanse themselves of any defiling. The Jews would also, at that time, would wash their cups and pitchers and utensils and, and, and everything else. And so Jesus orders for those, those pots to be filled all the way to the brim with water. And then they were to draw some water out. And the master of the feast, he, of course, tastes it and realizes that this is not only wine, But this, as the end of verse number 10 says, was good wine. Now, before we get into what the text actually means, I do believe it is fair to, to mention some things in relation to what Jesus was not intending to do in this account. Many people, of course, use this text to justify drinking of, of, of whatever proportion, whether socially, moderately, or, or any other descriptor they want to attach to it. But for those of us who have lived lives around those who would be considered alcoholics, we know very well that for many people there is no such thing as social drinking. We know for some people that it is impossible to just have one or two drinks. I'm reminded of of the old country song uh, sung by a fellow by the name of T. Graham Brown. And and it goes something to this effect. You've heard a multitude of prayers on my behalf. I pray one more is not too much to ask. I've tried to fight this battle by myself. But it's a war that I can't win without your help. Tonight I'm as low as any man can go. I'm down and I can't fall much farther. And once upon a time you turned the water into wine. And now I'm on my knees. I'm turning to you, Father. Could you help me turn the wine back into water? So many times I've hurt the ones I love. I've pushed them to the edge of giving up. 
They've stood by me, but now how much can they stand if I don't put this bottle into your hands? I shook my fist at heaven for all the hell that I've been through. Now I'm begging for forgiveness and a miracle from you. Because tonight I'm as low as any man can go. I'm down and I can't fall much farther. And once upon a time you turned the water into wine. And now I'm on my knees. I'm turning to you, Father. Could you help me turn the wine back in to water? Even in cases where alcoholism or full-blown intoxication is not present, I don't think that most people who just drink a little bit realize the problems that they occur that occur within families. Whether it's swerving on, on the way home from the party, or whether it's the harsh language that is directed toward the wife and children, or if it's or whether it's the flirty language to people who are outside of the marital context. Alcohol tends to always cause problems especially to the loved ones who are constantly having to deal with the family member who always needs to drink. But as we consider this text in John chapter 2, one of the things that is fair to understand is that the word wine is the Greek word oinos, where we get our understanding of juice or grape juice, the, the fruit of the vine. The good wine refers to it being more powerful, but to the first century man, the the good wine was the freshest. It was the best of the best. Albert Barnes, a, a New Testament commentator and scholar, writes the following about this text. This shows that this had all the qualities of real wine. We should not be deceived by the phrase good wine. We often use the phrase to denote that it is good in proportion to its strength and its power to intoxicate. But no such sense is to be attracted to the word here. Plutarch and Aristotle and others describe wine as good or mention it that as the best wine, which was harmless or innocent. The most useful wine was that which had little strength. The most wholesome wine was that which had not been adulterated by the addition of anything to the juice. And others expressly say that a good wine was one that was destitute of spirit. Barnes concludes it should not be assumed, therefore, that the good wine was stronger than the other. It is rather to be presumed that it was milder. We say all of that to say that Jesus did not use his miraculous power to produce 120 gallons or more of intoxicating wine. We know, and I think we're all full of good common sense, that Jesus' intention was not everyone to get wasted here at this wedding at Cana. However, at the same time, inspiration in the Apostle John, as far as his writing, did not include this story about Jesus turning the water into wine for us to argue and debate about how much alcohol should or should not be drank by the Christian. And so if if all of that is true, then what exactly is going on here in Cana? Why would Jesus turn the water into wine? We know he didn't want all of those folks to get drunk. But what was the purpose? And so our sermon this morning is actually entitled, What's on Tap at Cana? And we're using the letters T-A-P to make three observations pertaining to the rationale and the motivation of Jesus turning this water into wine. The first observation is the, the idea of transformation. Jesus was powerful. He is powerful. And he can transform anything to become anything else. He can transform water and it can very easily become 
wine. And and he can, of course, transform our lives as well. He doesn't simply want us to to be able to to endure life and and to, uh, to basically survive. Rather, he wants us to thrive in this life. It's not like he's just putting a a little band-aid over our hurts and pains of this world, but he's wanting to heal us and transform us and change us. He's wanting to turn frowns into smiles, as others have said. He's wanting to turn fear into hope. He's wanting to change sorrow into joy. And he wants to turn death into life. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And the Bible does say in Romans chapter 12, verse number 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, as Christians, we are changed. We have been transformed and we continue to be transformed as we are striving to reflect the image of Christ in our lives. So what's on tap at Cana? Why did Jesus turn this water into wine? It was about transformation. And secondly, it's about abundance as well. Notice he didn't just tell them to to put a little bit of water in those pots, but but Jesus told them to fill them up to the brim. He wanted the idea of abundance more than enough to be the idea being captured there. Now, we understand what abundance means. And in fact, many folks foolishly live a life that trying to obtain more and more stuff. And they, they feel like they'll be happier if they can, can get more stuff to add to their already existing collections of other stuff. But the Bible does say Jesus specifically in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. But we are to live a life of abundance. Again, we're not just trying to survive as God's people, but we're thriving. We're doing awesome. We're doing great. Life cannot become any better when we're living the faithful Christian life. Life. In fact, Jesus says it this way later in this book, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse number 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And we're all familiar with the 23rd Psalm. And and yes, that psalm is often read at funerals, but that psalm is all about for the folks who are still alive, who are are, are experiencing this relationship with God. In verse number 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. And the end of verse number 5 in Psalm 23 says, My cup runs over. Our lives are filled with the abundance of God's grace, the abundance of His love, His mercy, and the abundance of the many, many blessings that we have experienced from God. And third and finally this morning, as we're asking the question, what's on tap at Cana? Yes, the idea of transformation and abundance. But third and finally, the idea of the presence of God. Wine had a symbolic meaning, and we've already discussed how the the first and earlier centuries wine definitions might be a bit different than ours, but it, wine carried with it in the Old Testament a symbolic meaning at times of joy and blessings 
of God. Listen to just a few verses in the Old Testament that are demonstrating God's presence as he's using wine as a metaphor, or wine as a symbol to demonstrate his presence with the people. Isaiah chapter 25, verse number 6. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. Also in the book of Joel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Scripture says that so you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and water from the valley of Shittim. Back in John, back to John chapter two, the the wedding had no had no wine, and so first century Judaism is being pictured as one the people as separated from God, and in a sense no longer receiving God's blessings and favor. But Jesus comes to the wedding feast, and He is reminding the people that He is the Son of God. He is miraculous. He has the ability to do signs. And He has the ability to keep the people into the presence of God. This, for this sign, this is the first of seven in the book of John of Jesus performing that is recorded for us. Jesus, of course, goes on and does many other things. And in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, the Bible says, And truly... Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. You see, the presence of Christ, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. We know in Matthew 28, verse 20 says about Jesus telling us to go into all the world. And to carry that great commission. And that end of that verse concludes by saying, And lo, I am with you always. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 24, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Why did Jesus turn that water into wine? It was to demonstrate his transformative power of transformation occurring and how that applies and relates to the lives of his people. He was communicating there that, that the life of faith, the life of Christianity is one of abundance. And of course, he's communicating to the people that by performing this sign, performing this miracle, they should know, and by the life of Jesus and later his death, burial, and resurrection, that the presence of God is with them there on that day. And the presence of God continues to be with us today for those of us who are Christians. As we close this morning, one last verse, John chapter 2, verse number 11. This beginning of signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. In just a few moments, we are going to sing a song of invitation and a song of encouragement. And, and we want you to know that Jesus desires to transform your life through the grace of God and through his crucifixion on the cross, his blood being shed. We all have the opportunity to become new, to have all of our sins washed away, the old man being washed away with the new man being arisen from the watery grave of baptism, having a new life, forgiveness of all sins. 
and we want you to know and we want to encourage maybe someone that's here that is a Christian but, but needs to come back to the Lord to start enjoying that abundant life again and to start enjoying the presence of God in their life. We all want to live transformed lives in the full abundance of God's grace and His blessings, knowing that Jesus will be with us always and knowing that He is right now at the presence of God the Father, making intercession for us on our behalf. When we live our lives in this manner, we too will be able to manifest the glory of God and we too will help others to believe in Jesus Christ as the one and only, the true Son of God. This morning, if you need to come for any reason, will you do so while together we stand and sing?